Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jesus de la Garza, uh, director of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Air Sciences. And it's a real, real pleasure to welcome you to this distinguished lecture. It, it is a joint distinguished lecture between the Glenn Department of Civil Engineering and the NERI Department of Construction, Development, and Planning. Uh, we're joined this afternoon by the department chair of the Glenn Department of Civil Engineering, Dr. Jennifer Ogle. And we're also joined by the department chair of the Department of Construction, Development and Planning, Dr. Mike Jackson. Uh, now to our guest of honor, um, Jordan Comp. Uh, has been with Thornton Tomasetti for the last 13 years, also known as TT. He got his BS, MS degree from Marquette University. And I want to inject a commentary here. He is a product of the BS to the MS program, just like we have here at Clemson University. So not only does the BS to the MS program exist in our policies, he is, he's an example of how you can get your master's degree in one year, right after your BS degree. So for those of you who are thinking about it, uh, you can ask Jordan about the logistics and the things that he had to do to get it done. He is a licensed professional engineer in the state of um, Wisconsin. And he's also an accredited mass timber special inspector. Engineering News Record uh, named him the Midwest top young professional. He's also member of the American Society of Civil Engineers tall building committee. And as importantly, he's member of the ACE chapter in Milwaukee. The eighth chapter are those people like Jordan who work with high schoolers to educate them about careers in architecture, engineering, and construction. So with that, would you please join me in welcoming Jordan Com to Clemson University. Thank you so much for that. It really is a pleasure to be here and, and speaking with all of you today. It was an honor to walk around your campus today and hear about all the exciting things that are going around here. I'm really jealous. You know, a lot of these things didn't exist at my time at Marquette. So you guys are in a fantastic position to really take advantage of all the opportunities you have. Um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, Ascent Tower, which was built in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, as I get started, here's just a few TT slides that they make us throw in at the start. Um, if you have any questions as I'm talking, please feel free. I, I know you guys, this is a class for you guys and you have things to do after this, but if you have any questions, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm here to answer any questions you guys have. So uh, high level, I'm not sure by raise of hands, how many people have heard of mass timber before or sort of know anything about it? Sort of about half. So what I'm gonna to try to do in this presentation is talk a little bit about what is mass timber, sort of talk about how that relates to ascent and the design process throughout ascent and some things that went into the, uh, the ascent permitting process and construction, and they really dovetail into the future of mass timber, which could relate to some of the research you guys are doing here at Clemson. So what is mass timber? What makes it different than other types of timber? So for example, if uh, single family homes typically are what we call light framed or stick construction, really the difference comes down to this word mass. So it's the size. The, the idea that what you're doing with these panels is, or these pieces of wood are that they're much larger than you typically would see at a, a stick framed house construction. And I'll get into a little later about why that matters. Why is it important that these panels are the sizes that they are? Um, so really, this, really the genesis of this started about 20 to 25 years ago in Germany with the creation of these floor slabs or these floor panels. Far and away, the most common one that you're gonna see in the industry is CLT, so cross laminated timber. And really it's just sort of what the picture shows there with different panels that are uh, laid lengthwise and then cross perpendicular to each other, which creates some dimensional stability for the structure. Uh, and they're glued together and it gives you some flexibility in the field. Uh, one of the cons currently, and really one of the only cons is in the North America, there's sort of a limited amount of manufacturers. So from an economic standpoint, you're somewhat limited and, and because there's so few manufacturers that might tend to raise up the price 
Uh, but what we're going to talk about here in, in this presentation is sort of how you can mitigate those factors and sort of what the outlook of mass timber looks like and how we're going to take advantage of some of the factors we do have in the future. Uh, there are alternate systems. I won't spend a lot of time. One of these called NLT is really a sort of a simplified version where you take two by sixes, nail each panel next to itself. And one of the benefits of this is obviously it's cheaper, there's less labor or it's less intensive involved, but it's also the con in that there's a, it's hard to control the QAQC process in this because you're putting so many boards next to each other and it takes so much time. Uh, there's a lot of things I'll say that potentially could go wrong. And actually because of that, the people that did some of the first NLT projects in North America developed this secondary system called DLT, which is dowel laminated timber, where the same concept, but they take these panels and they use some, some heat induced dowels and they actually thread them through. And then these clamp the buildings together and they actually call this the quote unquote 100% wood system because there's very little glue or screws or nails involved in this particular panel. So if you've ever been in an old historic cathedral or things like that, you've seen those large wood beams, typically previous before mass timber, those were called heavy timber. And more than likely, you probably saw glue laminated timber. That's far and away the most common uh, system used for beams and columns, which is just a bunch of pieces of, of wood simply put that are glued together. Now, there are other sorts of systems. There, I show a picture there of parallel strand lumber um, and also laminated veneer timber. They all work structurally and they all have behave slightly differently, but you can tell they differently have pros and cons. So, for example, the one in the middle, you can likely see that if we're trying to expose the mass timber, it's just not as aesthetically pleasing for our architectural friends here, right? It looks a lot like plywood. Uh, so while it works structurally, there's other aspects to consider when we're under design. Whereas the LVL at the right there, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it has really high structural capacity, but it's also more expensive. So just there's pros and cons to every different system, but far and away, if you're looking at mass timber, you're likely gonna be dealing with the, the glue laminated uh, timber there at the right. So why would someone wanna use mass timber? There's a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, I think a lot of people know now, it's been out long enough, the idea of the sustainable, the benefits of it in terms of a renewable resource, and not only just the, the resource itself, but the low fabrication emissions to actually utilize it in the industry takes far less than you would, to, if you can think of the heating and the process required for steel and or creating the cement paste and, and the things that go into the concrete. Um, obviously also aesthetics, you can see from these pictures, I know when I started working on uh, scent, they gave us lots of interesting stories about how they would put babies in a floor. And on one side, they would have a, a, a wood framed building. On the other, they'd have steel or concrete. And they said far and away, the children always went to the mass timber. So it's this idea of what they call biophilia, that humans like mass timber, they like to be in contact with it, they like to be in touch with timber. Um, but then there's also construction benefits, right? There's an increased sort of idea of speed of construction with prefabrication. Uh, the idea that you can have these things prefabricated so that you can fit them out ahead of time and the fact that mass timber is so much lighter than uh, concrete construction that you can uh, reduce the foundation demand on your building. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but uh, I think I'm sure in a lot of your classes you've sort of gone on to this process about why the life cycle uh, and, and a lot of things I talked about here with manufacturing the CLT and the mass timber and how much more efficient it is really over um, steel or concrete from a sustainability uh, aspect. Um, and here's some facts. I get a lot of questions a lot of times with people asking, is it really sustainable? Is it really beneficial to our environment if you're cutting down trees, if you're cutting down our forests to build this building, how is that sustainable? And really a couple of things I'd like to point out here. One is what I found is it only would take 25 minutes to regrow the amount of wood uh, that it took to build ascent. And ascent is the tallest mass timber building in the world. So just orders of magnitude, less than 25 minutes in North American forests. Uh, some of the other things that I learned is that if you picture it, whenever you cut down these trees, if you sustainably forest, you, you regrow new trees. And these new trees can actually absorb carbon quicker than the old trees. So actually, if you do it right, the sustainable process is actually beneficial for the environment. And there's just a few sort of, I'll call them cute facts here with the amount of carbon that's sequestered in uh, the timber in ascent and sort of you know, taking 2,400 cars off the road uh, or I think, uh, what's the other one about how much you can, the energy to operate 1100 homes for a year. So just order magnitude, kind of the benefits of just one mass timber building. Um, the other thing is while in North America, particularly tall mass timber is relatively new to us. It's a growing phenomenon throughout the world and it's gonna continue to grow. And uh, something tells me that ascent wouldn't be the tallest mass timber structure in the world for long. Um, all right, next into a little bit into ascent. So. Ascent is located on the east side of Milwaukee. What you see on the right there is Lake Michigan. Um, uh, showing you here just some of the parts and pieces, the team and the players that were involved in Ascent. Uh, one thing to note, maybe that's a little different than if you're used to a steel or concrete job. There's a lot more coordination that goes into mass timber just because of the prefabricated nature of it. 
So on this one, for example, we had a general contractor, we had a timber contractor, and then both of the manufacturers of the CLT and the glue lamb, as well as the, the detailer that was heavily involved. And we were all part of this process. I think we had over 86, I think was the final number for uh, MEP coordination meetings. So making sure all the parts and pieces of the structure fit together and work uh, so that when they come to site, everything fits up the way it should. Uh, so a set itself. So it's 19 stories of mass timber over a six story concrete podium, the podium being parking. Uh, and it's roughly 284 feet tall. And it was, um, what I'm gonna talk about quite a bit throughout this presentation is how it was permitted. And it was actually permitted under essentially IBC 2015 and the alternate materials provisions. Uh, and as a result of this process, roughly half the mass timber is exposed in the final condition. And it's not because we had to by code, but simply because a lot of the spaces, whether it's a kitchen or a bathroom or a corridor or a mechanical unit, simply didn't require the mass timber to be exposed and there's financial benefits to concealing it. A few typical floor plans for you guys, just to look at the one on the left is typical parking, a typical mass timber residential in the middle, and then the amenity floor at the upper roof, which I'll give you some pictures of when we're done here. Uh, so the system, not only did we want to take advantage of the, the, the mass timber aesthetically, but we wanted to take advantage of the lightweight. So one of the things we did was that in terms of the, the system for the foundations, we used concrete filled steel pipe piles. Uh, and in addition to um, taking advantage of the lightweight, we actually statically load tested these. So it's interesting to note that by doing this, these were actually the highest capacity piles in the state of Wisconsin. And by testing it, we actually got twice the capacity that you would without testing. So if you use just what the code told you, you would get only a roughly a 200 ton pile. And so by using the same steel, the same concrete, the same length, the same material, by testing it and going through this procedure and sort of this regimented process with the geotechnical engineer, we were able to over double the capacity. And actually it's interesting if you see that big reaction frame there, that big red frame, that's what limited that capacity. It wasn't that the piles didn't work anymore. It was that they said they were gonna break the frame if, if we made them keep testing. So a couple of pictures here, the bottom right, that's our typical parking level. It's a seven and a half inch PT slab, which is pretty standard for parking. Uh, there's a few more columns than maybe you could use long span beams, but uh, the, the formwork that was saved from the contractor made it beneficial to go to the typical parking. But then what you see in the upper left there is you can imagine that the, the column grid, so the spacing of those vertical elements is not the same for a concrete parking structure and a residential mass timber frame. So what we had at that upper floor is what we call our transfer level. You can see in the upper left there, there's actually that, that divot there and in the bottom right, those were for an in-ground pool or sorry, an in-floor pool and a mechanical zone. So we actually had five to six feet of depth to work with to transfer out all these columns. Uh, but because of the lightweight of the mass timber, we really only needed three and a half to four and a half feet. And actually, interestingly enough, because the mass timber is so light, they had to do what's called stage stressing. So when you PT it, you're actually pulling on these cables. So you're actually trying to make it bend in the opposite direction you think it's going to in the end condition. Uh, but because it was so light, we couldn't do them all at once. Otherwise, we would have actually cracked the beam going up. So the contractor had to stress half of them, wait till they got all the way up the height of the building, and then stress the other ones till we had enough weight. And then here, so this is the basic mass timber floor. So our column grid in one direction was 20 to 25 feet, and then the other, it was anywhere from 15 to 20 feet. And then between them, we had glue lamb beams. And then between those glue lamb beams, we had the uh, CLT panels we talked about earlier, which were what we call five plies. So it meant five laminations of those uh, pieces of wood crossing each other. Uh, and on top of there, roughly seven inches thick. And on top of that, we had two to three inches of lightweight concrete. Uh, and then what you see there as well is those RC cores. So one thing I like to point out here is that the, the reason we use reinforced concrete was a sort of a request from the firefighters in the city of Milwaukee. So I'm gonna get into the variance process we had to go with this because this is a little above and beyond what the code currently allows for the prescriptive method for mass timber. Uh, and it was something where they felt more comfortable with a concrete core. It wasn't that we thought structurally you couldn't have used CLT panels, um, but it was something that they felt comfortable with. So as part of the process, that's, that's the direction we went as a team. Uh, a few more things. So ascent, we had a lot of different connections, but really two, we break them down into two basic ones. So here, what we call the framework connector, and I'll get into that a little bit later, uh, due to a project in Portland, Oregon called framework. And this was a connection that had been previously fire tested, which is the reason we used it on our project. And what was nice is that in terms of prefabrication, that piece of steel actually came to site already installed in the column. And then we actually put a wood block at the bottom there that protects it from fire in the end condition. And then the other one, which is a much simpler connection, I'll say is a wood to wood bearing connection. Uh, and the reason for this is just from a cost of, uh, effective standpoint, it's, there's less material, there's less steel involved. So it's much cheaper, but it's not as robust a connection. So in terms of that, we only use this one at interior conditions where it was gonna be concealed for uh, fire protection reasons. 
And here you can sort of see big picture the different systems for ascent. So you have the concrete filled steel pipe piles at the base, the, the PT podium parking structure, uh, the reinforced concrete cores we talked about, the glue lamb beams and columns, and then the CLT slabs. So let's see if I can get this to play. This is really quickly just uh, give you an idea of how these parts and pieces come together. So uh, you'll see at the base here, the piles going into the ground. We actually had a surprisingly small amount. We had, I think, about 100 piles, which may sound like a lot, but not for a building of this size. Uh, you can see the PT going through here and now getting to this transfer floor uh, where we have the deeper beams that allow for the transition between the, the column grid below to the, the mass timber column grid above. And you can sort of see just the parts and pieces, the, the various glue lamb beams and columns being set, uh, as well as the CLT on top of it. All right, so now into things that you might not think about when you're designing with mass timber versus say another steel or concrete project. So one of the things is the material itself. When you're dealing with steel or concrete, the material properties don't necessarily have an impact on what it looks like. And more, more likely you're not necessarily cared with what the structure looks like because it's going to be concealed by the architect. With mass timber, more than likely it's going to be exposed and the architect and the owner are gonna have an opinion on what it looks like. They might want a different species depending on which species you have, you can see there, all species have a different color, whether you have like a uh, Austrian spruce that's a little whiter in nature, a Douglas fir, which could be red, or a, a yellow pine, a southern yellow pine, which could be more yellowish. So depending on what your, your architect, your owner, your team wants, those different properties mean different things to the structural engineer. They have different strengths. They have different stiffnesses. Uh, and in the case of uh, scent, we actually got our wood from Europe. We got our wood from Austria. And so in addition to visually looking different, uh, European woods are graded differently. They're designed differently. And so what we had to do for Ascent is we actually had to do multiple designs. So we had to design it in NDS, which is the North American US design standard. And then we had to design it in the Euro code, which was the design standard that the wood would normally be designed in. And then we had to do what we call the hybrid design, which is sort of trying to marry the two uh, for the code officials to make sure that we essentially did three designs verifying the, the capacity uh, of the structure. Also sound and vibration, right? Uh, uh, mass timber, it's, it's beneficial because it's light, but because it's light, it's also less dense, which makes it more susceptible to sound and vibration uh, impact. So there's ways around that. There's ways to mitigate that. There's design guides for the vibration, but also we have uh, what we call floor assemblies and built up. I told you for ascent, we had a two to three inch concrete topping slab. Uh, but on top of that, you have a sound mat. I think ascent actually had two sound mats uh, in addition to a, a gypcrete topping slab. But it's, it's ways that non-structural ways that we try to manage and mitigate sort of any sound or vibration concerns throughout the structure. Uh, another interesting one is that there is not a lot of current research on tall mass timber buildings because there simply aren't many. Uh, when you're doing any kind of structure, what we have a picture there is a TT project that's Jetta Tower, um, which if it ever gets completed, it would be the tallest in the world. When you have tall buildings, regardless of material, steel, concrete, mass timber, over time, there's what they shorten essentially. So as, as the material is consistently under load, it wants to shrink a little bit. And as a result of that, during construction, we need to account for that. Uh, and so in the idea with the scent is we actually had what we see there is a shim schedule. So we actually told the contractor as they were constructing it, they surveyed each column at each floor up the entire height of the building so that based on our research and our predictions, we could anticipate where we thought the building would be vertically. And if we were seeing the movement, we thought we would. And if we were, we left the schedule the way it was, but if it wasn't, we could adjust and either add more or less shims to make sure that vertically the structure was aligned to where we thought it should be. Also, I, I mentioned coordination. Obviously, there's a lot of coordination that goes into mass timber. You can see even just the screws there, so that's not even interdisciplinary. That's just a lot of the structure and trying to make sure that you can thread these screws in between each other and you don't have conflicts in the field. But then what you can see there on the right is this idea of you have all sorts of mechanical, electrical, plumbing fire protection and things that need to work together with the structure so that you always need to be cognizant that it's not one team, it's, it's, it's a multiple teams, multiple trades that are trying to work together uh, to make for a successful project. And again, here's just another picture. You can sort of see all the parts and pieces and the mechanical systems that went into the coordination involved in the structure. Uh, and it's, it's kind of people laugh that I, I got this far into the presentation without really talking about fire, because when you're talking about mass timber, you're talking about a combustible material. So the idea of versus this versus say concrete uh, and this idea of uh, fire rating and how you're going to protect the structure or real more, more accurately how the structure is going to protect itself. So one of the most common ways is in the code, there's what's called the char method. And so if you think about a bonfire and in a, in a bonfire, you have a couple different pieces of wood, right? You have kindling or something that's intended to burn quickly. 
it starts and the point is to start the fire, but then you have much bigger, thicker logs that over time can burn throughout the entire night. What you see is on the outside, when you see that blackening of the outside, that's the char. And what it does is it actually protects the inside of the wood. So as a structural engineer, we actually can calculate over time based on equations in the NDS, how, how uh, frequently this char is going to integrate into the structure. And what's left on the inside is what we actually have as a protective layer. And sometimes they use the word sacrificial layer. I know firefighters don't like the word sacrificial when you're talking about mass timber, but essentially you're, you're dealing with this outside layer that protects the inside of the wood. You can also full scale load test some of these things. I know you guys do a lot of testing for strength here at Clemson. They also can do this with a, uh, depending on where you are, the forest product laboratory helped us here for ascent. And I'll talk about that a little later, uh, but you can also do element tests, individual scaled testing of the parts and pieces. So the panels, the, the beams, the columns, the connections, you can get certifications from the manufacturers that certify that they actually tested it for certain loads, for certain ratings, for certain time, uh, or you can conceal them, right? You could use um, panels, you can use gyp on the outside, or you could use intumescent paint if you're dealing with steel. So there's a lot of various ways to deal with the fire perspective of, of mass timber. And it just sort of depends on architecturally what you're looking for and structurally what makes sense. In, in the terms of ascent, we actually used all of them. So for the beams, we utilize the, the char method to calculate the, uh, the, the char that would burn over time. Uh, for the columns, because of the, the ratings and the variance I'll get into here in a little bit, we actually had to complete what we think is the world's first three hour column test for a char. So what you see there is actually a piece of wood. It's a column that was being burned inside the furnace. And then on the right for the CLT, we ran our own numbers as engineers, but we also had uh, cert certificates from the CLT manufacturer uh, verifying that they were good for the two hour rating that was needed. So the permitting process, this is sort of really the whole ball of wax for ascent. So there's sort of three precedents that were important to the start of uh, ascent. So on the left there, T3, that was really more of an economical benefit. So this was developed by Heinz. And what it showed in North America was that mass timber could be viable financially, not just architecturally beautiful, not just structurally sound, but financially Heinz would not do it. If anyone knows anything about Heinz, the developer, they wouldn't build it if it wasn't going to make money. So financially, it was beneficial to the entire community to show that mass timber could be financially viable. The project in the middle there is Brock Commons in, in Canada. And that was before Ascent, the tallest mass timber building in North America at 18 stories. However, it's a little bit different system, but also it was fully concealed. So while it had some of the benefits of the, the, the fabrication and the timeline for, for mass timber, you really didn't get this biophilia, this benefit of actually seeing the mass timber. And then on the right, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to say the name of that, but before Ascent, that was the world's tallest mass timber building. And it's roughly the same height. I believe it's 280 feet uh, versus the 284-ish for Ascent. Uh, big thing when we're talking fire is this idea of non-combustible materials, right? And it's, you know, we don't need to hide from this fact. We don't need to run from it, but mass timber is a combustible material. So the question is, how do we, if the code says that for certain types of structures, you have to use non-combustible materials, how do we get the code officials to allow us to utilize this product? And how do we as professionals verify that it's safe for people to be inside the building? So if you were by code, which is sort of a prescriptive method, which means that it tells you if you wanna do X, you must do Y. And typically this is based on past research and things of that nature. So before in IBC 2015, which is what this would have been permitted under for office buildings and residential buildings, you could only be anywhere from 65 to 85 feet tall and anywhere from five to six stories tall. So again, I, I told you Ascent is 25 stories tall. And I told you that by code, you can only go 65 feet and we went 285-ish feet. So you can start to get an impression of really the ask that we were giving of the city officials. And sort of I'll talk about some of the work that went into doing this. Now, there were sort of alternate ways to slightly increase some of these heights, right? There's what they call podium construction, where at the base you use what's called a type 1A type of construction. It's a more robust fire rated construction. And then on top of that, you can put uh, lighter rated, this would be like stick construction, like a lot of times this is used for like uh, residential apartment buildings that are on top of a one story parking structure. Here's an example of what that might look like in sort of a hybrid where you're using the stick construction for the walls, but then you're still utilizing the CLT for the floors. So you get the visual look that you're looking for on top of a concrete podium. Um, but what's interesting is I sort of told you by code that you could only go five stories, but in 2017, a project in Portland, Oregon, while it did not get uh, constructed because there were some financial challenges at the end phases, uh, it was permitted and approved at 12 stories. So they essentially doubled the height of the code. And then just another three years later, Ascent doubled their height. So you can sort of see this exponential growth in the height of mass timber and sort of see how you think that that's going to handle the future. Um, 
again, in IBC 2021, this was after uh, we had started the permitting process for ascent, but they actually came up with new sort of, instead of what used to be one just heavy timber for, for mass timber, they actually came up with three types, so type four, A, B, and C, which are all various ratings of, of fire protection. And over time, it's this idea of, you know, the taller one that has to be fully concealed, the, the middle one there at 4B, where you can expose part of the mass timber, and then the one at the left there where you get to fully expose the structure. But what's important to note out and that I really want to stress to everyone is you can even see right there in the middle, even from 2021 to 2024, instead of exposing only 20%, they now let you expose 100% of the ceilings. And so what's important is that these aren't safety limitations. It doesn't mean that if you have a building taller than 18 stories and it's not concealed, there's a problem, right? Because obviously ascent is 25 stories and not concealed. So these are more of a function of the permitting process and just what goes into place and working with city officials based on really what existing tests are there and what comfort and what liability they're willing to take on uh, versus the design team. So how did we do this? In IBC, there's what's called the alternate materials provision. Essentially what's highlighted there is it says that as long as you are sort of providing equivalent performance and, and what does performance mean? It can mean lots of things to a lot of people. In terms of this presentation, we're gonna specifically talk about fire resistance, uh, but as, essentially what it says is as long as you provide the same performance as the code, they are not there to stop you from using any different materials and any different design processes, any construction processes, but is incumbent on the design team and construction team to verify that you are meeting the same performance criteria. So what does that mean? What did we do? So for any normal high rise other than a mass timber high rise, it would be what's called a type 1A construction. And what that means is the, the, the columns for the structure need to be rated for three hours. They need to be able to survive a fire for three hours where the rest of the structures so the beams and the slabs would be rated for two hours. So what we did with the city is we said, if we can verify, if we can convince you that we can, we can achieve this rating, that from a safety perspective, all the columns can be designed for three hours of fire and the beams and slabs will be designed for two hours of fire. Are you comfortable? Is that, is that a process that works for you that we can improve equivalency? And they said, yes. So essentially what they ended up doing was instead of though permitting as type 1A, they said, we still want you to permit as type four. So that's heavy timber construction but they gave us a variance on the number of floors and the height of the structure, a significant variance, right? Going from 85 feet to 240, 280 feet and going from five floors to 25 floors. If we could uh, convince them or, or prove the fire resistance of the process, as well as a few other things that I'll show here in just a little bit. So for the fire rating, as I mentioned, we did a lot of different things on ascent. We, we used the char method to, to verify that the fire rating over time met what was in the code. We did individual member testing and what we did is that three hour column test. And the reason that that's interesting or important is that there had never been a three hour column test because there had never been a need to. All other structures before this barely had a rating of one hour, one and a half hours max. So there just simply wasn't a need to have anything rated for three hours. So while the code didn't explicitly say you could use those equations up to three hours, simply using engineering judgment and, and mechanics and materials, it, it made sense to us that the, the char, the outside actually insulates the inside. So over time, this, this char rate should slow down or be better structurally. It simply was a function of it didn't exist. So it was sort of a check mark in a box we had to check for the, uh, the code officials, which I can successfully confirm to you that it did, it did slow down. It was successful. You can sort of see there with the lines. Uh, we used the code um, prescribed rate, but it actually was slightly lower in a good way. Uh, and all this information is available if you are interested on the, on the network. This was um, from the Forest Products Laboratory. Uh, so they published all this and it's available if you ever do any future research or future projects. Uh, and again, there's different ways to rate each of these members. I talked about whether you're using the char method, actually testing it in the lab or getting it from the manufacturer. There's all sorts of different ways to rate these things for fire. Uh, and this is the framework connector that I talked about. This was the unique one in that, as I mentioned, as you can imagine, if there wasn't a three hour rating for columns, there probably wasn't a two hour rating for all the connectors. But because of this project in Portland, Oregon, they actually had to get it load tested as part of their fair variance process. So in working with the city, we said, can, if we utilize the same connector that's already been rated for two hours, is that acceptable? Uh, and they said, yes. So we utilized a somewhat similar connection to this one. We sort of tweaked it for our own efficiencies and it was originally tested for a high seismic zone, which we are not in Milwaukee. We're governed by being off the lake and by wind. Um, but with that, the code officials felt comfortable that if we utilize this connection, it had already been tested for uh, two hours. But in addition to that, there were a lot of other things that we talked about with the code officials. So one that's interesting is in Wisconsin, we don't have what's called special inspections. So in IBC, it's essentially inspections of critical parts of the structure. So whether you're PT stressing or you're welding pieces of steel together, there's usually special inspectors, people that go out to site and their sole purpose is to inspect certain elements of the project. 
We didn't have that in Wisconsin, but as part of our variance process, they asked that we do that. So I, I became licensed or certified accredited as a special inspector and was on site uh, three to five days a week, depending on where they were in construction, to watch it and make sure that it was being constructed per our design documents, per the drawings. Uh, but also, as you can see there, there's a lot of things that went into the project that are, what well, I would say, non-structural. Things, whether it's the, the sprinkler system, the dual water main, the smoke detectors, how it was uh, constructed during the time to, to prevent fires during construction. There's a lot that goes into the process that's not just structural. There's a lot of architectural construction, a lot of things as an, an entire team to get this permit and this variance with the city. So a, a few pictures of what we're dealing with uh, during construction. So uh, on the left there, you can see the start of construction and you actually see that A-frame. That was actually, we had originally wanted to use some PT beams, but because of the deflections that the rest of the structure would see, uh, they wouldn't have been able to start putting on the facade till the building was nearly three quarters complete. And so instead of that, we worked with the team to create those A-frame columns. And it actually worked out well, not just A for ascent, but it's actually A is the, uh, the mother's maiden name of one of the developers. So he liked that as an homage to his mother. So now there's that A that you can, you can barely see it, but it's there through the, through the facade. Uh, and so now I'm just gonna walk you through some of the, the parts and pieces that actually went into uh, constructing ascent. So you can see the columns, but each, each of the columns was individually picked and put into place by the tower crane. At the left there, that's one that was at the exterior that was going to be exposed in the end condition. And then the one there at the right, that's an interior one, which has a, a bit of a simpler connection that I'll show you in a minute, uh, but both were literally picked and set into place. Uh, the, the beams, one of the beauties of this is due to the prefabrication, due to the fact that that um, piece of steel actually came to site already pre-installed on the column, was it's very simple to erect. It really was the, the crane gets put into place, they set it down, there's two screws that go on the underside, and then the beam is set and they're on to the next piece. Uh, they said to meet their schedule, they actually had to be setting a beam or column or piece of CLT one every seven minutes. And again, these CLT panels actually came to site day of. So they came into the port of Milwaukee, then they would get freighted up to site and they would literally be dropped off next to the site of the site. And each one would be individually picked and put into place. And then they move on to the next one. And then here is, we call these screws, but you can picture from some of these, these aren't necessarily the, the screws you would think of at like a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Some of these screws were actually 36 inches long and one inch in diameter. And some of those, you can see that that guy was using, I think Milwaukee tool is actually the one that came up with the final battery, but they did not want to use a cord, uh, cord on their drills. They wanted to use cordless drills. And so they could only get in two to three screws with one battery. So they had a giant set of batteries behind this thing and they had to dump them and replace them every two to three minutes. So there's an entire field of, of charging stations behind it, but it's just sort of, you know, they, they would laugh and they, you know, they would, they would give us some, some business for calling these screws when they were 36 inches long. And you can see all the work that the, the gentleman, I think there was over 200,000 screws installed in the field and over 400,000 installed in the factory before it came to site. And now how do all these parts and pieces come together? So on the left here, these are what we call the, uh, these are the ones that were gonna be exposed in the end condition. So they had to put epoxy in the holes and those rods that came prefabricated or pre-attached um, from the manufacturer and they would just be set vertically into space. And this was one of those for the mass timber special inspections that we had to have someone there uh, continuously inspecting and being there on site to watch this process taking place. Obviously the reason being that you can't see the epoxy. So it's important that we know that it was put into place and the right amount of it, because once it's in, there's no way to verify that the epoxy is there. Uh, this is the, the simpler connection, the interior connection where it's essentially this fourth condition where they put screws into the side. It's a much less robust connection. And so it was used at the interior, but because it's less robust, it's also much more efficient economically. So it's trying to find that balance between when do you actually need the additional strength structurally versus when do you need to find the money to make this a viable project financially. Uh, and then here's that framework connector. Again, you can sort of see the slot that comes in the beam that's set on that framework connector and they install the two screws. On the right there, if you see the steel, that means that it has to be concealed from a fire protection standpoint. So that steel is gonna be drywalled if it was gonna be exposed, there's actually a notch in there and we put a wood block in and the wood block actually protects the steel. All right, I'll use this one. 
All right, and so now you can start to see some of this entire mass timber structure coming together. You can see sort of one of the simplifi simplification processes of mass timber is if you look at all the, the, the formwork here and all the uh, braces, it may seem like a lot, but it's really not if you've ever been to a construction site with a concrete project in the amount of, of formwork and shoring and reshoring that's involved. Really, this is it for the project. And once they put in the CLT panels, once those panels are screwed down and attached to the core, you can completely remove all of these. And then you can start putting in your mechanical, your electrical, your plumbing, your fire protection. So you can have people working on this um, immediately once you have that CLT floor from above put in. And the contractor was doing roughly one floor per week by the time they got into it, which is more or less comparable with what you would see for concrete construction, except for the fact that now they could start working directly underneath it, which is something they couldn't do for concrete. Again, you just see a few of these bents uh, coming in and some of these floors. You can start to see here some of the water. One of the important things with mass timber is that it's going to get wet and that's okay. It's not that wood cannot get wet, right? You've all seen, you know, if you've gone to a water park, you see mass timber, not in mass timber, but you see wood structures exposed to water all the time. The importance is how do we get the water out of the system? How do we handle the humidity? How do we handle the moisture? Making sure that you don't suck it out too carefully. One of the things we talk about on this project is that the gypcrete, so the concrete topping that goes in above this, is actually not put in place until all of the, the facade was on the building. So what we wanted to be really careful about is there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of moisture with the concrete curing process. And so there was a really specific dehumidification process but really our concern structurally was not necessarily with dehumidifying, getting the moisture out, but it was over dehumidifying, over sucking out too much moisture and getting cracking in the wood. So again, it's maybe counterintuitive that we weren't necessarily worried about the moisture getting in. We were more worried about how quickly we got it out. Uh, then some connections. One thing, if anyone's been on a job site, and, and maybe it's worth noting that different materials move differently and they also have different tolerances. So mass timber has a very tight tolerance. It could be within a millimeter or two. That's not the same as concrete. Concrete could be inches. So when you build these two together, you need to make sure you account for the different variances, the different tolerances and construction tolerances that go into this. What you can see there and on the bottom right is we sort of thought we were clever and we were trying to use some long slotted connections to give them some flexibility. But what you can see there by the fact that they weren't able to install those last two bolts is even then we still didn't give them enough. They still missed and because these move in the formwork as you construct the structure, we actually ended up moving to an upper right there and sort of a lessons learned is that this post installed anchor was a much more efficient way for the contractor to go. Yes, it was more work on site, but by the time the sort of the, the challenges and logistics they had with those slots, they think it would have been more efficient uh, to simply post install things from the start. And here's that upper floor I was talking about. And so you can start to see these beautiful 20 to 25 foot open uh, mass timber exposed floors and those connections you see at the top there, and I think I have one on the next screen. Uh, those holes there, what those are, there's actually a, a knife plate and steel rods that go through there that are anchored and bolted through. And the reason we needed those at the roof as opposed to anywhere else is because by code, because the mass timber is so light, technically the code would say that the roof would wanna float away. If there's enough of a windstorm, the roof would wanna lift off the rest of the structure. So what we actually had to do is tie down that structure to the rest of it. And those connections actually vary three stories down before we had enough weight of the structure to actually tie the whole thing together to make sure it wouldn't wanna quote unquote float away. Again, just seeing some of the sloped panels being installed at the roof. And then this is a picture, this is inside one of the units. It's one of the corner units right above that A-frame. Uh, and then this is a picture of the amenity space at the upper levels. So now getting into the future of mass timber, and this is sort of where you guys come in. I already mentioned that we had talked about how the code has changed significantly since 2015 with the sort of incurrence of these new type four A, B, and C but also the fact that from 2021 to 2024, they've already changed it. And these changes are not due to changes of materials, changes of safety. It's simply due to the amount of research that's been done. They, they tested these, they tested bigger buildings and bigger labs with bigger structures and were able to then prove, which everyone inherently knows as a structural engineer, that, that they, they are safe and that they're acceptable. So as, as more of this data becomes available, the code officials are more and more willing um, to increase the um, or lower the limits that are required on mass timber structures. So reducing the amount of variances that are required to get the structure in. And so what you see here is one of the, the, um, the fire tests that was completed in San Antonio. And sort of what we actually saw, which was interesting, is that a lot of these structures self-extinguished over time. So it wasn't even that there was a two to three hour rating that the fire self-extinguished over time. So again, not necessarily what maybe intuitively when you think of a combustible material, it's sort of when you're talking about mass timber and you have things of this size and this shape, it, it really is sort of a different animal, I'll say, 
than what you're used to with, say, of a, a stick or light-framed wood construction. Uh, another thing that's really important, is, and this is uh, Woodworks, which is a, a mass timber organization, or a wood organization in general, they actually put together what they call here this, this mass timber business case. So one of the important things that I haven't really talked about on, on this presentation is that for buildings to get constructed, they need to be financially viable. They need to be beneficial in some way, shape, or form, but, but developers, owners are typically not going to construct something unless they get something out of it. And a lot of times for developers is they're looking for financial benefit. And so over time currently with mass timber, because of some of the unknowns, I'll say with code officials and, and letting them give approvals and variances for processes, sometimes there's additional costs with these, but what's important to understand and what you can, if you go to the website and read through some of these things, there's lots of benefits to mass timber that are maybe not just in the weight of the material, right? Whether you're thinking of, if you're going to expose it, you don't have to paint ceilings, you don't have to drywall ceilings. Uh, uh, what I talked about with, they can start mechanical electrical plumbing roughings very much earlier than you could in a typical project. You're gonna have light, light foundations, you're gonna save money there. So really the point of this is to sort of show that in the future, as we do more and more research, we can really start to show people the benefits of mass timber and the idea that it really can be cost competitive with steel or concrete or any other material. Uh, this is one example, this is in Chicago. And if anyone knows history on the Chicago fire, it's very difficult to use mass timber or wood in general in Chicago, they're just very hesitant. So we were actually excited that this is one of the first ones and it's the first one that's been approved in I think 100 years uh, through the standards and testing committee of a, a mass timber structure that's gonna be in downtown Chicago. That'll be that 4B type structure. I believe it's nine stories and might get up to 10 stories. But again, just showing this sort of baby steps approach, right? That uh, in terms of the world in general, the United States is a bit further behind Europe in terms of uting, utilizing mass timber. Uh, but as you can see with the scent, we're catching up very quickly. Uh, and this is something that you guys are very familiar with here at, at Clemson and sort of this is, I've heard it called the holy grail for uh, engineers here and this idea of mass timber, right? If, you, if you've ever designed a, a steel building, we have a concrete, uh, we have a steel form deck with concrete on top of it. You put studs on it, you connect it to steel beams and you have a composite system. And the idea that both of these systems you know, work together and they're stronger than anyone separately. Uh, the, the challenge with this is not, you know, one, there's the doing the research to verify what is the strength of a system like this, but also working through it and, and figuring out how does this system work from a construction standpoint, right? You can imagine it's very challenging for a contractor to build this if all those screws are sticking up. If you're going to put a uh, system on top of it for like a soundproofing mat, it's very challenging if you have to penetrate the mat a lot of times. So again, it's keeping in mind that it's not just structurally does it work. It's not just do the mechanics and materials. It's not just does the science work but it's, does it work architecturally? Does it work from a construction standpoint? These are all things that really matter to make sure that you get this under construction. Uh, connections, two R rated. As I mentioned at the time of ascent, there was literally one connection that was rated for two hours. I know for a fact now there's three to four different companies that have two R fire rated connections. And why is this important? The more there are, the, the, lower, the, the lower the cost of these connections they'll be, right? The lower the cost, the more mass timber we can, it'll become more cost competitive and the more mass timber structures you'll see. Uh, Hybrid structures as well, right? One of the real big benefits or one of the things is if you take, you got to use materials with what they're good at, right? That's sort of what you learn throughout school. So when you're dealing with steel, steel is great that it goes long spans relatively easily. That's uh, one of the benefits of steel. So the idea of using steel beams so you can span long spans, but then still using the CLT floor slabs above it, you get the beauty of the exposed mass timber, but you get the wide open column spans of the steel. And if you do it right, you can actually see that you can reduce the head height by sort of uh, embedding the CLT inside the depth of the steel. Likewise, you can do the same thing with concrete. This is a project that we're now working on out of our Milwaukee office. It will actually technically be taller than ascent when it's completed. But this idea of using a, uh, the CLT is actually formwork for the bottom to pour a cast in place concrete beam. And then on top of that, you run the CLT slabs and a concrete topping slab on top of that. Um, so really this idea of using materials for their benefit, taking advantage of what they're good at. Uh, and then this idea of that, you know, the, the future is really mass timber is a relatively young uh, entity. And the idea that you guys, as you grow up and you start to do some of these research and this testing, really there's a lot available in the future and it's, it's really exciting. And it's that you're on the forefront and just the start of this as, as a mass timber industry. And so hopefully I wanted to leave at least a few minutes to answer any questions you guys have. I think I left just a few. This is your future questions. We have about four minutes for questions. Please. The 
Sure. Yeah, and it's a little confusing, and in, in, uh, in the idea that if you take the rate of how quickly a tree grows, and the fact of if the vast amount of forest, and really it's an unutilized forest in North America, and you take over the entire thing the amount of growth over one minute, for example, and it'll grow, you know, 0.001% of a tree. But if you take it over the entire forest, uh, that amount of time in the wood that it would take is actually really only equivalent to 25 minutes. Yeah, so the mass timber portion for those uh, 19 floors took a little less than six months. And they were doing roughly a floor a week by the time they were done. Yeah. What would the, what would the price difference be if it was built with all concrete? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's a really tricky question because it depends on the timing. And actually due to, if you take advantage of the, uh, the foundation reduction, the fact that you didn't have to paint it, the fact that the drywall wasn't there, they actually, what I heard from the developer was that this was roughly within 5% of what they thought a concrete structure would have been. But really that's time dependent. I, I think even if you ask that now with the sort of shortages of materials, that answer might be different. But at the time they said, once they took advantage of the, the schedule savings, all the other benefits, I think they said within 5%. Yeah. Yeah, the, the question was, uh, when I talked about these and there's different competing materials, is the goal that this will be as prevalent as steel or concrete? And I guess the answer is maybe. It depends who you ask and, and, and what you're doing it for. So it's not necessarily, and again, I'm not here to say that mass timber is better than any other, than any other resource, steel or concrete, but it does have benefits that the others don't from aesthetic, aesthetically to sustainability, right? When we think about the future, when you think about the 2030 AIA, pledge and the 2050 um, structural pledge, there are benefits to mass timber that the others don't have. Um, so maybe not necessarily one taking the place of the other, but simply using them all for their optimum use. Yeah. Yeah, and I would never say maybe, well, so there's some, for example, you notice that the bottom of this, uh, the podium on ascent uh, was concrete. And that's because in Wisconsin, we have a lot of de-icing salts and we have very harsh winters. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Not that you even couldn't if you wanted to, and there'd be some precautions, but not that you couldn't, but that's maybe not the optimal use of mass timber. And also if you picture long spans, and I know that's something that you guys are working on here at, at Clemson. Um, currently mass timber, it's not that it can't go long spans and you've probably seen some beautiful glue lamb arched, you know, stadiums, but generally speaking, there's a cost premium to going long with mass timber. So that's one of those conditions where not that you can't, but maybe a material like a steel is more cost effective at the moment for going for longer spans. We have three more things to, oh, one more question. Last question. Did you face any problems with like procurement? Yeah, the question was, were there any challenges with procurement? And, and honestly, we got very lucky in that this was just before COVID. Uh, and so there were some challenges going from Austria, going from Europe in that we, uh, the team was very much at risk that if something happened and it wasn't delivered, we couldn't go to a Home Depot. We couldn't get a new one. This could set the schedule off. But fortunately, just due to a lot of the work that the contractor did on making sure things arrived prior to when they needed them, we actually luckily did not have any real issues. Actually, the only issues we had with were, were some of the smaller pieces of wood, the splines that weren't even the larger mass timber elements. But even then, we got very fortunate with the timing uh, of ascent that we didn't have any procurement issues. Please join me in giving Jordan another round of applause. We want to send uh, Jordan off um, back to Wisconsin, but before he goes back, we want to show Clemson's appreciation for him spending a day with us here, with faculty and students. And so we're going to present him with a gift, a small token to show a really Clemson appreciation uh, it's made out of wood. It's not CLT, but nonetheless, uh, it is a Clemson. Uh, it's a Clemson chair. Uh, I hope it still fits on your overhead compartment. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. you. Don't have to carry that one. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. There is a plaque on the back with Jordan's name and uh, the distinguished lecture acknowledgement. Uh, there is a reception waiting for you outside. Um, 
so please help yourselves to, to some food uh, before you go to your next class. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>